Today I am in studio with Nicholas Stewart, who is the co-founder of the East Watkini Bridge Project, formerly the Swaziland uh, Bridge Project. So Nicholas, thank you so much for joining us uh, today in our studio. Thanks for having me, Andrew. It's yeah. my pleasure. So start us off with a little bit about you, and then um, I guess how did you originally have this vision that uh, East Watkini needed internet? Sure. So a little bit about me, I'm a third generation military, uh, two of my grandfather served, uh, my mom was in for 21 years, my dad for 26 years, and then I served for five and a half years myself. So uh, I traveled. Thank you for your service. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I traveled around quite a bit. Um, I think at this point I've lived almost 14 years outside the US and I've been to 29 countries altogether. Wow. Um, how, many, how many have you lived in? Uh, coming up on, it was six before Swaziland for at least a year, okay. but I'm coming up on my year in Swaziland, so it'll be seven right. countries that I've lived in All for right. at least a year. Yep, um, a lot of them in Southeast Asia. Mm. Uh, spent a year in Afghanistan as well, and then um, some stuff in Europe too. Um, <clears throat> so in 2014, uh, my church uh, in Maryland was taking its first trip to Swaziland. Uh, the country's now called East Watini, but, um, and, you, but and just for a quick, do you know why sure. they, they named, they changed the name or like, do yeah, you know so, the story behind uh, that? I do. So um, last year was a large anniversary of uh, freedom and independence for the kingdom of Swaziland. And so the king, instead of using the westernized version of the name of the country, reverted it back to Eswatini. Mm. Uh, so instead of being Swaziland, which is easier for Western folks to say, um, he decided that it was time to revert back to their original uh, name, which was Eswatini. Okay, yeah. it's good to know, because when I, when I first saw it, I was like, are they trying to make it more innovative? Because like the <laughs> E, like, you know, like I, I, iPhone Eswatini, or sure. like, um, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's good to know that. So, uh, mm. okay, so back to your story. Sure. Um, where, where were we at? Yeah, so in uh, 2014, um, our church was taking its first trip to Swaziland. Um, and my wife and I uh, were just dating at the time during our first trip there. We really fell in love with the people in the country. And we saw a lot of what the other NGOs were doing on the ground. We got a bit of a, an idea of some of the issues that the kingdom was struggling with at the time. And when we returned back after our first trip, we started to really think between the two of us how, how we could use our skills to have a generational impact on the kingdom. Uh, a lot of the organizations that are doing great work in Swaziland are helping to fight HIV and AIDS. A lot of them are doing great things with hunger and helping pay for uh, the school fees of kids. But one of the things that Alicia and I were reflecting on is if I feed you today while you're in school and I help you with your school fees, what happens to you after you age out of that program or after you graduate from high school? Um, and really the term generational impact is what we began to focus on. And we spent probably six or nine months between the two of us kicking around different ideas and brainstorming. At the time, uh, I was working at an engineering firm and um, Alicia, my wife, is a high school math teacher. Um, <clears throat> The engineering firm that I was working at, there's a gentleman uh, named Perrin who um, did a lot of our web and graphic design stuff. Mm -hmm. And he and I were playing chess one day and we got to ch uh, chatting about just the growth in India of the telecommunications industry. And I was actually uh, reminded back in 2005, uh, the army told me, hey, we're sending you to South Korea for a year. Um, at that time, I didn't know anything about the U.S.-Korean War history. I didn't speak the language at all. Um, so I was able to walk to the local library and learn about the history of our, uh, the United States in uh, Korea in that conflict, but also to learn some of the language. And a light bulb really came on for me that day that we were playing chess. Um, there's the old adage about knowledge being power. Well, the Internet contains all recorded human knowledge ever. Um, and so from my wife being an educator and myself being uh, technologically oriented, we kind of connected those dots and realized that <clears throat> uh, helping to bridge the digital divide in Eswatini was um, uh, something that we could do to use our skills to have that generational impact. Got it. And so when, 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 when was your time in South Korea? Uh, I was there in 2006 and 2007. Okay, yep. great. And I mean, I've been, so South Korea is really one of those 
um, amazing case studies of mm -hmm. a country that went from very, very low income, very poor to mm -hmm. an o OECD country. And, yeah. But, you know, someone that was or a country that was taking aid to one that started to give it out. Definitely. And so it was probably a good experience to kind yeah. of observe yeah. that on the and ground. And even from a technological standpoint, they've got some of the fastest internet on the planet. Um, even from the mobile uh, cell phone standpoint, they've been innovating and really at the forefront of a lot of different things um, decade before we were here in the U.S. Right. So. And so, so when you first went to East Watine, I mean, what, t tell us what it's like there. I mean, is it, sure. are, are, is it like just like a bunch of little towns or like what's, you know, what's, yeah. what's it like? Yeah, so for um, any of your listeners who may not know where East Watine is, uh, it's in the southern part of Africa. It's bordered on three sides by South Africa and by Mozambique on the fourth. Mm. Uh, it's a very mountainous place as well. Um, agriculture is one of their largest industries there. Because of their uh, moderate climate, their growing season is very long. Mm -hmm. And because of the richness of soil, uh, they can grow almost anything. Um, I've been, uh, I've seen in, in Iswatini where there's a 30 foot pine tree next to a cactus, mm -hmm. um, uh, poinsettias, uh, near bamboo uh, plants as well. Just uh, because of the richness of the soil there, there's um, a lot of sugar cane and sugar. Uh, Coca-Cola also has a factory there in Swaziland. Um, yeah, just very warm and friendly people. Uh, the food's good as well. The uh, weather is uh, fantastic. I'm not yeah. a fan of cold, so. Um, I feel that. <laughs> yeah, it's, we're, 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 get, we're getting there in D.C. It's, yeah. it's close to that time of year. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> having a moderate temperature for the most of the year is definitely enjoyable. Um, just very friendly people. Like I said, that's why even our first trip there, we really f just fell in love with uh, Swati people. And um, I mentioned the focus of our organization is to help bridge a digital divide. We take what I refer to as a holistic approach to doing that. Um, some NGOs and organizations focus on different aspects uh, where they're maybe just focusing on internet as uh, access. Some of them are just focusing on the hardware component and some just on the training piece, but we try to do um, a four-pillared approach. So on the connectivity side, uh, we've been working with organizations connecting local high schools in Swaziland and also um, private businesses and homes as well using fixed-point wireless internet. Okay. Uh, on the device access piece, we've worked on refurbishing computers and things like that. One of the things that I say is if a school has internet but they don't have computers, have we actually solved the problem? Um, and then the third pillar uh, after devices being the digital literacy, which we actually cover a very wide spectrum from the basics of Microsoft Office all the way to helping uh, students get their CCNA, uh, Cisco certifications. Again, if I give you internet and a computer but you don't know how to turn it on, have I actually solved the problem again? Mm. <clears throat> um, earlier this year, we received our certification as a Cisco Networking Academy. So we've been offering a lot of uh, classes online for students and some in person as well uh, on the basics of cybersecurity, digital literacy, uh, Internet of Things devices, and a couple of others, uh, okay. basics of networking. Our goal is to help build a solid foundation of IT knowledge um, so that way we can transition those students into more advanced programs. When right. um, my wife Alicia and I were talking a few years ago, we recognized if you were to get a group of 10 Swatis in the room, uh, they'd have varying degrees of computer exposure and knowledge. So the question that we had is where do you start? You can't just take all 10 of them and put them in an A-plus certification course if seven out of 10 haven't even used a computer before. So using some of the fundamental foundation classes that we're teaching to build that uh, core knowledge is helping us move towards the a longer term goal of getting a plus CCNA and uh, some of the more advanced Cisco yeah. courses as well. Okay. And so I mean, what are what are some of the biggest challenges around like the like uh, you know implementing ICT infrastructure? Because mm -hmm. like in in Africa, there's such a there's just so much land. It's such a big landmass that sure. you know last mile internet has been such a the, the economies of scale of the last mile internet has been such a, such a challenge, right? You have the internet C cables that, that plug in at the ends, and then you know how do you actually get that internet in, inland, right? I think Iswatini might be a little bit easier than some other countries that are like that have just, like like the DRC, for example, mm -hmm. right? It's just there's just so much land, and there's not as much of an 
uh, a population that can actually sustain the uh, debt that would be required sure. to actually, you know, implement infrastructure across across the country. Sure. So, you know, what, what are some of the challenges you're facing in, sure. in, in, in East Watini? Uh, so this is true of East Watini as well as a lot okay. of the other countries on right. the continent. The cost of data is extremely expensive. Um, in the United States at home, which even in the U.S., there are pockets of the country that don't have regular right. access to high-speed Internet. Um, but for the most part, those who do, um, the level of access that a lot of homes in America have is not the case for 70% of the world. Um, on the continent, the cost of data can be about a third of your income, uh, so it makes it cost prohibitive. Uh, the device access piece, again, most data on the continent is consumed uh, through mobile phones, which offers some advantages if you recognize that piece. You can tailor content to mm. the, the mobile phone sector. But um, in addition to the price and the device piece, people having a, an idea of what the Internet is and what it's capable of doing um, I would almost label it akin to tr trying to describe the color blue to someone who's been blind their whole life. Mm. Um, any adjective that you use, any analogy that you use, there's not necessarily a frame of reference there. So even the statement that I made earlier about all recorded human knowledge being online, what does that mean to someone who hasn't been online before? Um, so we, we try to do a lot of, I'm a big believer in exposure. Um, you may be mechanically inclined, but don't have the ability to go to university to become a car mechanic, but you can go to YouTube and learn how to change oil, change brake pads, a lot of those things, and even more advanced mechanics. Um, but the, the realization that the information that you need or are looking for, it's out there. You just have to know how to ask the question the right way on the internet to get that information to come back to you. Right. So in addition to some of the cost and physical infrastructure, there's also just the um, digital literacy and awareness piece. Um, we've uh, traveled back and forth a few times from uh, East Swatini to South Africa, and some of our church friends that are uh, local Swatis um, once asked us, well, how do you know if you're driving there, how do you know to get there? They weren't familiar with a concept like GPS at all. Mm. The fact that not only is there a map from point A to point B, but your phone is tracking your active location from that point throughout the entire journey and telling you which turns to make. Um, so really just that education piece is, is a big part of what we try to focus on as well. Yeah. And by the way, wh when it comes to the road network, what, what is the infrastructure like in East Watini? Is it built as built out as South Africa or? No, there there's um, what's referred to as tar roads are okay. basically paved with asphalt and then there are non-tar roads. Um, some of them are gravel, a lot of them aren't. Uh, just even if you put gravel down it, during the rainy season, it might get washed out and okay. end up on mud. And um, in the US, we have speed bumps. They refer to them as speed humps there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a joke about from East Swatini to Johannesburg, there are 72 speed humps, and 73 uh, or 71 of them are in East Swatini, and only <laughs> one of them are in South Africa. So. Um, Things like that they use instead of traffic lights. Um, mm. So you're not having to run the electricity there and things like that to slow down the traffic you know, around intersections. Right. Um, I understand the purpose, uh, but it's definitely an adjustment that you have to make when yeah. you're <laughs> uh, going there. Even from my office to my home, I think we go over 10 or 12 speed humps. Yeah, so. yeah. I've, I've still, ne I've never driven in Africa. Mm. Um, I take Ubers, and mm. when I'm in the Uber, I just yep. like it's, it's unbelievable. The there, there, there's. Like the road is pretty much a free for all, but yeah. there is some level of rapport that yeah. happens, yeah. And, and they kind of know how to navigate. Unspoken like, rules. Exactly, and, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Like in Nairobi, for example, whenever I would take an Uber, like around rush hour ish, mm. like time period, uh, you know, you would there would just be these intersections where it was just you know cars were just like mm. uh, you had to be aggressive to squeeze your way in in order to get through, and mm. just 
uh, I was just waiting for someone to get hit or something, but yeah. you know, it's, <laughs> it's, they're very good at it. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. And um, then you also have to navigate things in, in East Watini, like cows that are mm, roaming the on the highway, right. on, the, <laughs> uh, on my driveway and yeah, <laughs> a lot of other things like that too. That's so, funny. So, yeah. I mean, what, what, what do some of the, um, like, what does the curriculum look like for the, the basic digital literacy mm. courses that, that you guys teach? Because you know, something like a YouTube is just so powerful. I, I see these random stories that pop up of like someone who got access to YouTube in their village and was able to just learn yeah. how to how to network and, and give internet access to their village. Yep. And my friend Pat Muhir, who's he's he's in Canada now, but he grew up in Rwanda, mm. um, and he used to go to the internet cafe and he would pay one dollar per day mm. um, for an hour of internet, mm. and he basically learned how to code in to to uh, yeah. like just through YouTube, just you know how to code, how to do this, how to do that. Yep. His first startup, he raised money from Tim Draper in Silicon Valley. Mm. His, his, he's already started onto his next one. Mm. And so that, you know, things we take for granted in the West, like YouTube, sure. if you just have access to that sure. and, and you're in somewhere like a rural village where there's a necessity to innovate, I mean, the, the those people, they'll, they'll have the discipline to actually mm. learn, you know? Um, but like, what what are some of the you know, sure. basic things that you onboard them with? Uh, with for our basic, it's called Get Connected, our basic digital literary, literacy course. It was designed by Cisco Networks. Mm -hmm. um, we go from the basics of this is the anatomy of the computer that's in front of you. This is a keyboard. Here's the power button. Um, explaining what a mouse or trackpad is, different input and output uh, devices as well, and then. Um, going onto the internet, explaining what social media networks are, how to set up an email account. Um, we also touch on some of the safety aspects um, that are taken for granted. So <clears throat> we've, I'm 36 now. Uh, MySpace was in 2005 or something. Mm -hmm. um, so being on social media is something that as American, we have more experience with. So knowing what information to put out there versus not, right. um, avoiding uh, trolls and getting scammed and things like that, those are also some of the areas that we try to focus on as well. As you have more people getting connected around the globe and on social media platforms, uh, knowing the, it, the good uses as well as some of the downsides are important things that we try to focus on as well. Yeah. Well, then you, you'd be interested in some of these reports that Peace Tech Lab puts out because um, they do a lot of analysis around um, hate speech, mm. dur especially during election periods, sure. right, when things get kind of... But, but there, there aren't any elections in East Watini, are no, there? No, there are. There are? Yeah, okay. there are. But, so they have a king, and then... Ha well, how does that work? Uh, East Watini is the last absolute monarch um, on the continent. Okay. Um, there's uh, a parliament uh, that's a bicameral le legislature similar to the U.S., how we have the House and the Senate. Interesting. Uh, and a portion of their representatives are selected by the king and a portion are selected by the citizens of Eswatini. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So that's the last absolute monarchy in Africa. Is it, hmm. Not in the world, just in Africa, right? I definitely on the continent, but I'm right. not sure about okay. the rest of the Interesting. planet. Interesting. Cool. Well, uh, I mean, with, with all the time you, you spend there, I'm sure you see other other opportunities as well, right? So, I guess, you know, what, what are the other, some of the other things that you're working on besides the bridge project? Sure. So, um, we have a few things that kind of feed our mission and our organization that are internal and a couple that are external. So, one of the internal um, things that we've been looking at is there are the um, online platforms like WeWork, uh, where uh, a coder or graphic arts designer can put their resume up and companies who are seeking those th fields can also put out um, proposals and projects that they need done. One of the things that we've looked at doing is, as we're getting people trained, Again, have we done the entire job if there's nothing for them to use their skill sets on? And if the industries that we're helping to foster aren't in the country or on the continent, are there ways that we can do that, uh, bring those jobs into the kingdom? And so platforms like WeWork are something that we're looking at as we have five And, and it's, it's called WeWork? Uh, yes, yep. Okay. Um, which is not, it's not something we're developing, it's something that's already out there. Right. Um, 
But there are companies in India who will have hundreds of coders working in a factory that a portion of them spend time bidding on WeWork jobs, the rest of them spend time executing those jobs. Mm. And so you may have a company in the US who's essentially outsourcing their digital labor. Um, so the, the cash flow and the revenue is now going into the country where the work is being done, not necessarily where the company needing the work is being based. And I think as the uh, internet connectivity and knowledge base grows, that that's one way uh, that we can help put uh, Swazis to work uh, generating income with the skills that they've learned. Yeah, I think other, there have been a lot of um, startup ecosystems that have pretty successfully done that. Mm. Uh, Buenos Aires is another one mm. that has really um, differentiated itself as an outsourcing hub of mm. you know low cost, yeah. very high talent. Um, but you know, what are the? I think you, you touched on it before a little bit, but mm. when it comes to the uh, the traditional economy sectors sure. like agriculture, mm -hmm. that uh, like what what are the specific sectors you think? would be ripe if, 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 you know, you all apply technology and the sure. Silicon Valley concept of startups mm -hmm. too, like what sectors do you think? Uh, there's, there's opportunity? um, agricultural and textile, uh, which adding technology to those fields, the type of work ends up shifting if you start automating things, right. um, which isn't a bad thing, but again, you have to have the knowledge base there, uh, to be able to do that. Um, from our standpoint, we're also looking at a few different uh, sort of external projects. Um, <clears throat> one of them is bringing more access to virtual reality in the kingdom. Mm. Uh, we're looking at setting up a VR cafe where people can come in to play games and uh, socialize, but also during the day, schools can leverage uh, that same system to take their students on a VR field trip to the Louvre or mm. Uh, university students being able to go through Nikola Tesla's laboratory and learn about some of his innovations. Um, so those are that's one of the things that we're also working on. Yeah, that's interesting. That makes sense. That's that's really interesting to kind of use Iswatini as uh, as a test bed for something that I mean, if it, if if you can figure out an interesting model over there, mm. I mean, you could, you could even take that to the U.S. because mm. VR itself is you know there's not really any. I don't think there are any VR cafes in DC I might be wrong on that uh, there are a few in there the, are. in the region yeah okay. uh, that are popping up um, most of them are focused on the gaming side and right. Um, right. which is um, just again from a business model standpoint are I'm again I'm a big believer in access mm -hmm. um, and if there's a block of four or five hours where everyone's at work or school and they're not using the facility that we set up for entertainment that it can be used for education yeah uh, and that's probably even in the u.s one of the models that some of the u.s companies might want to consider yeah. doing there's also um a few organizations that we've talked to uh where let's say you have an mri located in swaziland um but we don't if we didn't have any technicians who had experience working on those you can use virtual reality as a method of communication to do that there's a company in South Africa that we've started talks with. The platform they developed, uh, the cost of a, or the data consumption of a VR conversation from South Africa to Swaziland is less than it would to make a Skype call. Hmm. Yeah, so from a, uh, being low bandwidth intensive, that was something that definitely stuck out to us. Um, a lot of companies on the continent are using VR for industrial training uh, I can teach you how to use a forklift or other heavy equipment in a safe environment before putting you on uh, the physical equipment itself uh, to get oriented with it. There are mining companies that do the same thing as well mm -hmm. um, that offer a lot of safety training from mm. that aspect. So we're That's interesting. we're trying to take the VR platform in Eswatini and open it up to uh, a lot of the different possibilities that the technology is afforded. Yeah, I'm a little bit more excited about AR than mm. I am about VR, cause, uh, and, and I may be taint. So whenever I, I, someone says VR, I always just think of the picture with Mark Zuckerberg walking through the crowd and everyone just has their VR sure. uh, goggles on. It's sure. very dystopian and 1984-ish, <laughs> but mm. um, you know, I think I, I, so. I've been devel developing this 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 theory that I want to get your thoughts on. So my friend, my friend Mark uh, Mark Arlene Busiku, he's mm. he's Haitian. Okay. So he uh, he's in Port-au-Prince and he started Haiti's first 
incubation hub, their first incubator called the Banj. Mm. And uh, about a month, I guess it's about a month ago now, uh, there, there's a lot of civil, civil unrest happening in Haiti right now. Yep. Um, and so the incubator actually got destroyed. Mm. Only be, There's nothing political about it. It was just the wrong location. It was sure. on a street where there was also other some like embassies. And so it got destroyed. But in, in my conversation with him, kind of in the aftermath of that, it, it th this idea formed where if you have somewhere like, like a Haiti where the GDP is less than 10 billion, mm. uh, I think that if, if, if somewhere like that actually wants to have a, a globally competitive startup ecosystem, then they have to focus on getting diaspora to build successful startups in major markets mm. like the US sure. or China or maybe even South Africa. Right, because the local market isn't significant enough to sustain startups, because like mm. there's no there's no market. Like, and so I don't know, if, like, what what do you think about that in respect to Eswatini and potentially kind of tying tying startups there to to the South African market? Um, I do think that if you can solve a local problem, that a startup could potentially have the legs to grow from an economic standpoint. Um, one of the uh, startups that we do some consulting with in Eswatini is working on a fintech play. Um, across the continent, there are small vans uh, in Swaziland, they're called Kumbis, um, that people use for public transit. And so the ability to be able to pay for your Kumbi ride using um, mobile money um, or another electronic currency is something that they're looking at. But again, that's an... Uh, specifically a local need that would solve a local problem which would lead to adoption and you have to figure out your revenue models and things like that um i going back to your question obviously we're we're living in a global economy and um the more technology evolves the smaller the world gets but the idea of entrepreneurs from developing nations having to go to a larger market to get success, I would hope that there's a way to foster it in their own, um, uh, where they're from. Um, obviously, you've got uh, governmental things that you have to navigate depending on what country you're referring to and infrastructure and other things like that. But, um, you know, the there's studies saying that whatever percentage of the population globally under 30 is going to be on the continent of Africa by a right. certain year. Um, I do th uh, think it's important to build out those ecosystems as well. Um, I don't want to see people get left behind, I guess. And yeah, that's no, I agree. But I guess my, my point, I guess uh, the, the one thing I, I didn't mention, my, my point with that is it would definitely help the ecosystem prosper as long as those diasporans are committed to reinvesting wealth that they might that they get in through an exit, right? Sure. If the IPO, if they get acquired, they would have to commit to reinvesting that wealth back home. Mm. And in my mind, that's the best way um, to kind of create a startup ecosystem in, a, in an environment where there's not really a significant local market. I think the counterpoint to that would would be uh, somewhere like Iswatini, mm. like we said before, would be a good test bed, mm. right, for for a product. And if you could find a, um, if you can find econo unit economics that work through a fintech play or something in a market like that, yeah. I mean, you, you've probably discovered a secret that can scale to other markets as well. Uh, to a degree, but it's always um, important just to remember uh, the continent itself is 55 individual countries with different languages, cultures, uh, different problems needing to be solved. Um, one of the one of the inclinations that I think the U.S. tech sector has is to kind of copy, cut, and paste uh, a, a business model onto new countries, and that doesn't always work with adoption and right. things like that. So, um, my advice for an entrepreneur on the continent or in a developing nation would be really to identify. Uh, local issue, um, come up with 
an innovative solution to address that issue and and work from that perspective okay well, awesome well nicholas this has been fantastic let's let's finish this off um because you certainly inspired me to come to east Watini yeah, at please. some at some <laughs> point probably over, over the next year or two mm. um but anyone else that you you inspire to come what are the big like tourist attractions or like what are the fun things to do once once we're there yeah so um the kingdom of uh, Eswatini has uh, a few nature preserves. So if you want to go on a safari and look, see lions and giraffes, rhinos, zebras, uh, impalas, uh, hippopotamus, hippopotami, the plural. Of, I think hippopotamus yeah. is plural. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and a lot of those uh, animals that you see are there as well. Um, there are a few cultural villages where you can learn about the history of the kingdom mm. and see traditional dances, um, observe a lot of the tr different tribal cultures from history uh, in the kingdom as well. Um, try out a lot of the great food as well. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, thriving local restaurants in the kingdom. Um, what's like the local cuisine? Like what's, what are some of the dishes? Uh, so uh, pop is a corn-based, um, staple uh kind of a starch staple there i'd say it's akin to grits uh okay. but the texture's a little thicker mm. um a lot of really really good hot sauces and spicy uh peppers and things like that as well um uh because of the agricultural situation that i mentioned um so if you like chilies or hot food i do <laughs> i do there's definitely a lot there Great. um uh, there's uh, hiking as well, uh, beautiful mountain ranges. Which, which, by the way, whenever so whenever I'm in Africa and I'm mm. eating a spicy meal, they always they always kind of like assume just because I'm sure. like this white American sure. that's like, well, you need to be careful. Sure. Like, are you sure? Like, it's like, hey, bring it on. Like, yeah. I love spicy. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> I do. I, I do like hikes too, though. Mm. I'm a big fan. Uh, there's some whitewater rafting and some zip lining as well uh, in Swaziland, and um, a lot of jewelry manufacturing. Uh, there's some handcrafted uh, jewelry uh, that's made from gold and then from beads and other mm. things as well. Awesome. Well, Nicholas Stewart, co-founder of Swazi Bridge Project. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.